Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Bridget Cabrera, she, her, hers, and I'm the Executive Director of Methodist Federation for Social Action. MFSA has been around for over 100 years old. We're a faith-based policy and organizing network. Our mission is to mobilize, lead, and sustain a justice-seeking United Methodist movement, energizing people to be agents of God's justice, peace, and reconciliation. And we're so excited to uh, be continuing our webinar series with our co-host and partner, United Methodist for Kairos Response, UMKR. Um, we acknowledge this land and the many lands that you're joining us from, its history and all the being seen and unseen, known and unknown. And as we step into our work on these lands, most of, most of us as uninvited guests, we offer this work in the spirit of reparation, devoting ourselves to justice as we strive to uplift the legacy of this place and all of these places. Amen. A few announcements concerning our call today. Uh, by participating in our webinars, we covenant together to co-create an equitable and brave space where we learn, engage, and grow in relationship together. We are recording this webinar and that recording will be shared in the coming days on both MFSA and UMKR websites and social media. And as you have questions, um, we invite you to type them in the chat box. You do not have to wait um, till the Q&A time to send your questions in and you can direct those questions to me. I'll show up as Methodist Federation for Social Action. Um, we do have closed captioning available. It's automatically generated. So do expect that there'll be spe spelling errors um, and grammar errors, but um, we do have that uh, capability available as well. And now I'll turn this over to our moderator for our conversation today, Lisa Bender. Lisa is the chair of United Methodist for Kairos Response. Welcome everyone. I look forward to our time together today. First, I wanna let you know that United Methodist for Kairos Response, UMKR, is an international justice movement of United Methodist laity and clergy responding to the Kairos Palestine document and the ongoing work of Kairos Palestine and global Kairos for Justice. We educate and mobilize advocacy for Palestinian rights within our denomination and beyond striving for the goal of freedom, justice, and equality for all people of the Holy Land. This is September, the beginning of the school year, so our thoughts and prayers go out to children everywhere, but especially those in Palestine, whose lives are so disrupted by the occupation. But what about Palestinian children everywhere, and all children who should learn about Palestine? So we invited three guests who will be talking about children's education and the impacts that children's literature about Palestine can have on children and on us as adults. I don't know if it's true for you, but whenever I want to learn something new to me, I turn to the children's section of my local library to find books that give the simplest explanations before I move on to more challenging readings. Um, and I maybe you do that too. But in any event, um, our speakers today are, are Hannah Mushabek. She's a book editor and marketer with broad experience in the field of publishing and children's books. She's the author of a new picture book called Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine. Nora Lester Murad is an educator, activist, and author of the young adult novel, Ida in the Middle winner of the 2023 Arab American Book Award in the Young Adult category. Nora is a policy member at Al Shabaka and a co-founder of community organizations in Palestine. Abir Ramadan Shanawi is an education consultant currently developing materials for immigrant children's needs and an organizer and education advisor for BIPOC institutions and professional associations. So their longer and much more impressive bios will be in the chat for us. So um, we in UMCare recently heard about a Black father who was planning a trip to Palestine. 
His school age son was quite worried about whether his father would be safe and wanted to know more about where he'd be going. So the father, wanting to reassure his son, reviewed a few videos, but couldn't find anything age appropriate. So he sought out children's books to introduce his son to Palestine. And for me, as a new grandmother of a baby girl of Palestinian descent, I'm really looking forward to learning from our guests today. So let's begin with Nora and Hannah, who each have recently written books for young people. So um, Hannah, let's start with you. But Nora, both of these questions are for both of you. Why did you decide to write about Palestine? Maybe some of your personal story. Um, what did you write and what is important? What was important for you to include? So Hannah? Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. And, and firstly, I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be here. I, I love seeing everyone's faces. I think that's rare these days in, in virtual events. So that makes me uh, really happy. Um, so to tell a little bit about my story, you actually have to go back to uh, before I was born. Um, my family uh, fled the 1948 Nakba um, from Palestine to Beirut. And then uh, as the Beirut Civil War came on, my, my family fled again. So they have been made refugees twice uh, in their lifetime. My parents met in Jordan and they moved to New York in the 70s. And when they got here uh, as very literary people, they were really appalled by the lack of representation, not just of Palestinians, but of Arab Americans in the literary world. So they decided to do something about that. And in the year of my birth, they started Interlink Publishing, which is a small radical publishing house in Massachusetts. So my upbringing was a little different than everyone else's. On the weekends, we would go to book fairs or conferences, and I would be this, you know, three-year-old playing under the table, bored while my parents were talking about books all day. Um, but clearly something uh, was observed because as I grew up, I became a bookseller and then eventually uh, moved into publishing. And I have been in publishing for 10 years now. Um, I've worked at lots of different companies. I currently work at Simon & Schuster. So, uh, you know, we used to joke in my house that, um, you know, we would rebel and become doctors or something because uh, all ended up going into publishing, my sisters and I. So in, in I'm working in publishing, I was so desperate to work on a book by a Palestinian author. And I waited and I waited, you know, working at these various publishing companies and uh, one never came along. And so a couple of years ago, I decided to take that into my own hands and write my family's story. So I wrote Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine, which is a picture book about three little girls uh, growing up and hearing about their homeland only through the stories that their father tells them. So uh, a lot of research was involved in this. Um, I had to, you know, call up aunties and uncles in the Middle East to ask them about key details, which of course is, is like a three hour conversation. You can't just like call somebody and ask them for like a date. Um, but it has been such a joyful, incredible experience. The book came out in April and I have um, traveled around reading it to children and teaching them not about Palestine, but for those kids, uh, Palestinian themselves, um, often they're seeing a book with Palestinian representation for the first time. So, um, so that's the story of me and of uh, Homeland. Thanks. Nora, your turn. Well, um, the story of my book, Ida in the Middle, it's the first book I wrote. It's not the first book I published, but um, I wrote it when we were living in Palestine and raising our three daughters there. I'm Jewish American, married to a Palestinian Muslim, and we left the United States in 2004 Partly because the post, not partly, really, because the post 9-11 atmosphere in general and at the school where my oldest daughter went uh, was kind of a insidious and intangible racism that we didn't want our daughters to have that as their primary reference point. 
uh, for seeing or experiencing the world. So we moved to Palestine in 2004, and um, Ida in the Middle is based very much on our lives while we were living there, except for the magical part, which is a little device. Um, and and that's why I wrote the book. I wrote it to reflect our lives, and I wrote it for my own daughters. I was uh, fascinated by how how entranced they were by books. You know, they would walk around with noses in their books all the time, and I couldn't practically get their attention away from the books to see that we were in Palestine. So I said, let me see if I can write a book that would be as exciting for them as as these, um, you know, Harry Potter and Percy Jackson stories that they were reading. And uh, I wrote Ida in the middle and they loved it. And that was that. But uh, many years later, fast forward, uh, we moved to, to the United States. We returned to the United States in 2017, moved to Massachusetts, where I live now in 2019. And my youngest daughter was in high school in our city and was extremely uncomfortable as a Palestinian and ended up leaving the school. And what what student leaves school in to, in 12th grade to go to another school? Who does that? Um, because that's how unhappy she was. And she literally said, I don't want to graduate from a school that's not proud of me. And that was um, that meant that I now had two different experiences as a mother. I had the experience of being a mother of Palestinians living under Israeli occupation. And I had the experience of being the mother of Palestinians in the United States and experiencing anti-Palestinian racism. And so based on that, I then revised and rewrote the book I had written many years before to really enhance those aspects with very much in my mind, the fact that most Palestinian and non-Palestinian kids don't have access to books like this. And teachers, don't have access to books like mine when they want to teach uh, and encourage their students to be curious and to investigate and to develop their own informed opinions about Palestine. So that's why I wrote it and that's why I published it. And that's a great segue to a beer because she is a teacher, uh, was a teacher, and now works with other educators. But beer, why did you decide to teach and write curriculums about Palestine for school children? And how do you help help those who teach to include Palestine? Uh, thank you for having me be here. And I will always be a teacher's teacher, even though I'm not technically in the classroom anymore. Teaching about Palestine um, and why I write about Palestine, the answer to that is why not? It's my lived experience uh, growing up as a child of Palestinian immigrants. Uh, ironically, my mom is the refugee, not my father. Uh, my dad's town wasn't, they didn't have to move. My mom is pre-48. And growing up, I was always fascinated. The first thing that Palestinians ask you when you meet is, where are you from? And I always thought that was so annoying. We're so nosy. But later on, I realized that especially if you were from pre-48 borders, it's a way to carry on the legacy of knowing the towns that no longer exist and have changed. So my mom is from Deir Tarif. She would always have this long introduction. And now that I got older, I just understood the importance the reason why I do write and I taught about Palestine, and I nece didn't necessarily always teach it directly, being a social studies teacher, it's hard to avoid it, especially if you're teaching world history. American history in middle school doesn't touch upon more modern history. And when we taught about world cultures and we taught about world history, it would come up. But I was always in schools where students never had a teacher that looked like me, whether it was physically who my background was, so they always ask questions. And if you know middle schoolers, they're nosy as heck, and I love it. And so that's why I started. I, I believe that I needed to tell my story as a child of immigrants growing up on the south side of Chicago, which has one of the largest Palestinian populations in the country. But also I have a motto that says, if we don't tell our stories, somebody else will and they'll get it wrong. So I wanted to share my lived experience and I wanted my students to understand that there are other people out there who are either othered, come from areas where people are questioning you all the time and how do you maneuver those, um, those worlds? And my students understood that, but it's also my students have never either heard about it and then we talk about it. And then if they have heard about it, they are aware of what's going on. And that really led to a rich conversation. Um, and it was even more impactful when the last time I was in a school, I was in, a, in an area that was at one point predominantly uh, 
highly uh, Jewish population, but there were still some students who were Jewish who would go back and forth to Israel. And I loved having those conversations with them because they were able to feel free to be who they were in their authentic self in the classroom, but also learn about a different perspective. And it wasn't shoved down their throat in any way. You can talk to any of my students now and you can tell them that. But I think it's important for students to see their teachers navigate these these waters and these um, areas and knowing how to be your authentic self without losing yourself um, and how you represent yourself. So that's why I taught it and I write about it. And I think it's very important to leave that, to continue that legacy as we, you know, as we get older and leave it for our children. Right. Thank you. Um, all of you are involved in anti-racism efforts and have a concern for Palestine, for refugees, for immigrants. Um, some say these subjects are too difficult for children. So how and when should these subjects be addressed with children and what are the best tools to do so? Um, anybody want to jump in? I'll, I'll tackle that one first, given the fact that that's always something that happens, especially in social studies, whether we're talking about Palestine or one of the, the hottest topics that people are always asking is how do we teach slavery to elementary students? And the answer that I always gave my teachers was students know regardless whether we want to teach it to them or not and whether we discuss it in the classroom or not how these topics should be approached as we call it hard history as learning for justice would call it is the fact of putting everything in an inquiry concept having students really dig deeper and putting the onus more on the students to ask the questions to do the research and the teacher should be the facilitator as opposed to the other way around um, we're moving in that direction in general in all contents but i think in social studies especially helping students ask the right questions, knowing how to ask the questions and knowing how to answer them and guide them to where they can find resources would make a much better um, way of teaching that topic. And to be honest, I think we could start as young as second or third grade because kids are very aware. They're very self-conscious about what's going on. They come from lived experiences where they probably also come from communities that are marginalized. And even if they're not marginalized, they see things all over now with social media. They hear people talking about it. So why not discuss it, but put it in a frame that's age appropriate as well. And I love the topic and the, the, the quote from Professor Jeffries from the U Ohio State University who also writes for Learning for Justice. He works for them. He always tells high school and middle school social studies teachers, he's like, when I get students in college in my class and I teach them the hard history, they're not mad at me because I'm just teaching this to them brand new. They're mad at you when he's talking to high school and middle school teachers because you haven't taught it to them. And I think we owe it to our students for them to develop these skills and knowing how to analyze, how to ask questions, and also have to have meaningful dialogue with each other to really discuss what it means to be talking about a particular topic. So for me, I think it, if we center everything in inquiry based, I think we get a lot of more bang for our buck using that format. And then I can certainly speak, yeah, I can certainly speak to, um, you know, the younger kids. My book is a picture book and, you know, I have worked on a, a couple of books in my career. Um, mainly this book is anti-racist, which is such an incredible resource for educators and parents. And in reading and working on that book, um, I familiarized myself with quite a few studies that say that children as young as two or three years old can start to exhibit signs of bias. So to me, that says that we need to be combating it as early as possible. And this doesn't mean that we have to be telling two, three-year-olds about slavery, but there are some key things that we can do, one of which is showing uh, is representing uh, people in these groups. So, you know, identifying skin tone and color, identifying where people come from, discuss their backgrounds. These are all ways in which we send signifiers to young children that these people are are worthy, that these people are are part of us. You know, for my own family, we I have uh, nieces and nephews who are two to seven years old. And so when I first wrote this book, obviously, they were my first uh, test subjects in reading aloud to them. And my partner is a preschool teacher. And I asked them, I was like, you know, how much detail do I go into? What do I tell them about 
our history. And my partner recommended that I really work within the framework of concepts that they understand and that they're learning about in school. So we talk about fairness. What is fair and what is unfair in this situation? We talk about sharing. We talk about, um, you know, land and does anyone really own land as a concept? And they just completely get it and, and can recognize it. And in fact, often don't bring the, the biases that uh, we as adults bring to the table. You know, within minutes, they identify what is fair and what is fair um, with such mature. And, you know, my book isn't hard history, it is a celebration of being Palestinian. It is a celebration of Palestine. And to me, it was really important that they felt pride in their culture far before they ever learned about some of the hardships that we endured. So, and, you know, I can tell you that it's worked. <laughs> Sammy, my nephew, um, brought my book to school and proudly proclaimed that his uh, aunt was famous and had written a book. And he, in fact, is even illustrated in the pages of my book. Um, so, you know, he now feels a lot of pride about where he's come from. Wow. Nora, is there anything you want to add? Okay, you seem to be muted at the moment. Um, yes, someone had to allow me to unmute. <laughs> okay, okay. I actually have a lot to say on the subject. I think it's so important. Um, so one thing, um, when we do not bring in experiences of people who have suffered or been oppressed or who are being oppressed, when we leave those to the side, supposedly in the name of, you know, protecting the kids, what it does is it centers white privileged experience. Even if you don't mean to do that, just by excluding everybody else, you end up centering that and perpetuating the white privileged American in the English speaking experience as a norm against which then others are compared. So I think it's actually harmful not to teach this to kids. It's not just, is it harmful to teach? It is harmful to children not to teach it. And um, I think that's true for, for kids who are quote marginalized um, and also for kids who are who don't have that experience, but all kids do have that experience usually in some part of their identity. Um, kids can really identify with feeling like they don't belong or feeling othered or feeling out of place or that they can't be their full selves. Um, so the stories that are about kids can identify with those kids a lot of times. So that's one point that I would make. And then um, another point that I, I would just mention, because um, many of the people on this webinar probably saw last week's uh, Holy Land video Um, harmed by not having the full access to the range of perspectives and understanding, including really hard information like the Darius Sea massacre was mentioned by one of the interviewees. So, so I guess I just would ask, like, who are we protecting and what are we protecting them from? We're protecting them from knowledge, from learning. We're protecting them from human experience and from the opportunity to develop empathy and to develop an awareness of who they are in relation to these difficult life situations. Right, and not to keep Nora on the spot, but my next question's for Nora, um, because in an earlier conversation, you had shared with us about your research of analyzing children's books, um, looking for what was missing and or what really has been erased and wondered if you could tell us briefly what you discovered um, and, and give us some guidance what we should do about it. Yeah, sure. So I did this research with four Palestinian teachers. Abir was one of them. And we um, 
analyzed a whole bunch of books, ultimately about 56 children's books involving Palestine. And we learned that the very um, offensive, blatant racism that we expected was really not there that much. Um, some, but not as much as one would fear. What did what we did find that is pervasive in children's books for all ages is erasure. So we tried to kind of pull apart and analyze the the nuances of erasure, like how does it actually happen? And how would you or I or a teacher or a librarian look at a book and see what it is, what's not there? How do you do that? How do you see what's not there? So just to give you an example, and a longer article is coming out about this in the uh, AL in American Library Association's Young Adult Journal called YALS. Um, they are in their forthcoming issue having a longer article about this research, but just to mention three, one, three examples to give you uh, a taste of what we saw. So a lot of very young children's books about Israel have the Dome of the Rock or another East Jerusalem icon on the cover. And what that does for most of us, uh, or liberals, I don't want to say most of us, I can't quantify, but for, for liberal, open-minded, uh, peace-loving people, as we say, oh, good, this is diversity. This is beautiful. Here's a represent representation of Israel that includes uh, an Arab area. But East Jerusalem is not part of Israel. Israel claims that it is part of Israel, but by international law, it is not. The annexation of East Jerusalem to Israel was illegal. And until President Trump, it wasn't recognized by any country in the world. Since the since Israel is trying to, to distort the narrative to claim East Jerusalem as part of Israel, having that representation on a book about Israel is not diversity or inclusion or tolerance. It is misrepresentation, it's dishonesty, and it feeds into an Israeli narrative um, without the kids knowing and perhaps without the teachers knowing either. So that was a concern, just to mention one example. Another example is um, a lot of the uh, Christian-oriented books, and not only the Christian-oriented books, would show parts of Palestinian areas but without the Palestinians in them. So you'll see a picture of Via Della Rosa in the old city. Many folks have been there. And there'll be all tourists in the picture, but it's a Palestinian area. So Palestinians are literally erased, like literally just erased from their own physical surroundings in some of these books. Perhaps the writers and illustrators are trying to give the reader an image that they can relate to, but again, because there is uh, a, a battling over the narrative and the reality of who gets to be where, pictures that show Palestinian areas without Palestinians in them uh, support that narrative at the expense of Palestinian narratives. I have lots of examples. I'll just mention those two, because maybe what it can do is for all of us when we're choosing books to just have that heightened awareness about how messages can be really subtly communicated. Um, and then if we do use books that are problematic, there aren't enough books. So some of the books we use will be problematic to help the kids bring a critical lens to it as well. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, Abir, I'm gonna turn back to you because we've been quite concerned recently about book banning. We've heard a lot about it in the news. Many subjects are being attacked. Um, what's happening with, in schools with books about Palestine? Um, that's a really good question because from my perspective in middle school and high school, there were never many books directly linked to Palestine or Palestinian culture, unfortunately. There has been, um, I would say, a re, um, an influx of more authors who are Palestinian or Palestinian descent recently, maybe in the last five or 10 years, 
that have been publishing. But in the past, that was never the case because a lot of curriculum has been steeped, like Nura would say, steeped in whiteness, perspectives that don't include Palestinian voices. So a lot of the books that have been included or a lot of the curriculum that has been included either puts it in a deficit mindset, puts it as a like a little blurb, oh, the Nakba happened, move on. Um, and it puts it in a context of very geopolitical without any framing or understanding of the culture, the people, or the concept of refugee status of Palestinians or Palestinian Americans in general. Um, so from my perspective there, recently there's been a larger push thanks to the works of, you know, Hannah and Noura for creating these books where people have books written by Palestinians, but in the past it's always been written by people who are not from that lived experience. Therefore that's caused confusion. And that's also caused a narrative that's been the leading force in teaching. Um, but now, thankfully, when we have more of these movements, and this is why I always say it's important for us to align in these social justice movements, because what's social justice for one group is really social justice for all. So if we're looking to create these, these spaces for, say, Black Lives Matter, or we're looking for these spaces for LGBTQ+, we're also looking for these spaces rightfully for Palestinian voices and all the voices that need to be heard, because everybody needs to have their place in school, and we all know statistics have shown if students are engaged and see themselves reflected in the curriculum and the books, in the videos and the activities that they do in the classroom, they are more engaged and you create a better school climate. And these are all statistics. These aren't just things that people made up from their heads. So I think recently there's been more of a push and there's more there's been more intentionality from educators. And that's why what the work I do is very important is because we need to also include more people from those lived experiences to tell us what needs to be done and how we can work on creating those experiences for all students. Because if we don't, then we continue to um, use the same tropes and we continue to use the same methods that haven't been working for decades. So long answer to the question, but luckily there has been a huge push of amazing authors that have come out. So we're glad to see that. But unfortunately, when I was a teacher, I couldn't find it. That's why when I find these books, I just buy them and promote them because that's what also teachers are looking for and helping them navigate that in order to teach it based on also some of the frameworks that Noura and I are working on. Great. So some of us um, may teach Sunday school. Um, we're involved in our church or faith organization. Um, we may be grandparents, parents. We have may have contact with our local schools. I wondered, Hannah, can you give give us some suggestions about how we can find and use children's books about Palestine? Absolutely. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Interlink Publishing. We are a small but fierce uh, publishing company uh, run by my family. But we are also the largest um, publisher to, of, of Palestinian books or books about the Middle East. So interlinkbooks.com, I would definitely check it first. And I should also say that in two weeks in Philadelphia will be uh, the first in-person Palestine Rights Literary Festival, which is very exciting. Nora and I will be there. And um, it will be an annual festival. So while there may be only a few tickets left for this year, um, they will be having it annually. And I think it's gonna be an incredible resource and hopefully inspire lots of future uh, Palestinian books as well. All right, do you have any suggestions for what those of us might do in our uh, faith communities to, I mean, we, we probably could go out and buy these books and can we donate them to our school? Of course, always. And there are so many ways in which, um, you know, you can support the creators. I have to say one of the biggest blocks of representation is that publishers are not seeing books flying off the shelves. So the more you can support them by buying them, by following the authors, by reviewing the books on places like Goodreads and Amazon, all of this sends the message to publishers, but also to the New York Times bestseller list that these are issues we'll care about. So I would absolutely recommend looking up books by Palestine. I'll let Nora tell you about her incredible list, which has been thoroughly vetted. Um, and supporting the, the books that are, are true representation um, that are out there. 
Okay, Nora, tell us about your list. She's, she needs to be oh. unmuted. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, so if you go to the website from my book, Ida in the Middle, there's a teaching resources section. And there's lots of stuff in there, including a, a, a six week curriculum for sixth to ninth grades using my book, but also with exercises and lesson plans that can be used standalone. One of the things on the teaching resources pages is a link to my recommended reading list on a platform called uh, Kutubli which is um, in Lebanon, and it's got a lot of amazing curated lists, and I curate the list of English language Palestinian children's books, so I keep it updated, and folks can always go there and see the books that I and my friends, like Abir and Hannah, think are amazing. Wonderful. Um, a couple of us went to our local libraries or checked the online list to see what was there. And um, they, we live in more diverse areas, so we did find a few, but many of them were older and I think need to be updated. And we had talked before about um, donating books maybe to your children or grandchild's actual classroom as opposed to the school library, because there might be some guidelines that the library may impose where a classroom teacher is very excited to get new books. Um, we also talked a little bit about giving a book to our clergy person um, and or a Sunday school class so that it could be used maybe as part of a children's message in church um, or during a Sunday school lesson to point out more information about the Holy Land that isn't probably included in what their what their teaching resources are. So um, I just, you know, I, I'm excited about those possibilities. So um, I think it's time to hear a couple pages from your book, Hannah um, and Nora. Maybe Nora can just tell us about her book. I don't know if she's a reading or not. Um, but Hannah, what would you like to tell us or share from your book? All right. So there's two things I want to point out about my book, mostly because I want to brag about my illustrator project was, I only did 50% of this uh, creation. The illustrator Rima Do is truly incredible. Um, over the course of time that we worked on this book, I sent her hundreds and hundreds of photos of my family from the family archive, all the way from the 1800s photos that I had, all, all the way up to like, you know, my nieces and nephews now. So what she decided to do is use those photos to create the end pages. So instead of just including the photos, she illustrated them. So you can actually see here that when you open the book in black and white, there are photos of my family in Palestine. And I always, when I read this to kids, I say, what do we know when the photos are black and white? What does that tell us? And they say, they're old. <laughs> and then when you flip to the back of the book, you can see this is my family in the diaspora, including my nephew right here who took the book to school and showed all his friends. So it, it really was special to see this. This was entirely unprompted. She decided to do this on her own to pay homage to my family's story, um, which just made me feel so great. Um, and I'm gonna read my author note for you. So this is um, back. Sorry, I muted myself. In the back of the book, we have real life photos of my grandfather, my father, my sisters and I. Um, and we also have a glossary, which teaches children about the Arabic words that we've used in the book, um, as well as some of the, the food and the important cultural markers in the story. Um, and I wanted to include an author's note for educators and for parents so that they had a little bit more context to the story so that they could um, help their children understand um, why this happened to my family and how this happened to my family. Okay, so I'll read from it. My sisters and I grew up hearing stories of our homeland from our mother, father, aunts, and uncles. Sometimes I learned my history at family gatherings when the grown-ups became nostalgic and argued about how we were related to various people. No, your second cousins on both sides, not first cousins on one side. My family laughed about old stories between the hard times and during too. Sometimes stories were told to my mother by my father's mother, a bond between women 
secrets meant to be passed like recipes to her daughters. Someday I hope to pass these stories onto my own children, just like I'm sharing this with you. The story told to me and my sisters before bed in the room we shared were the best. In the same night, we would hear a tale of a hero climbing a tower to rescue a magical princess. And then we would learn about our father as a boy, skillfully evading grumpy priests and stealing sweets from his Tata's kitchen. Now it's hard to remember which were fairy tales and which were true as the stories blend together and our homeland feels more and more like a magical place. My family lived in the Katamon neighborhood in West Jerusalem until May 15th, 1948, the day Palestinians call al nakba or the catastrophe. On this day, all my relatives, after being warned of danger, packed small bags, locked their doors, piled into my grandfather's car and took sanctuary in the Greek Orthodox monastery next to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in East Jerusalem. They were never allowed to rid their homes, and to this day carry with them the keys to their houses now occupied by others. As the Mukhtar, my great-grandfather was permitted to live at the convent until he died. My relatives, including my father, visited the old city of Jerusalem each summer until the 1967 war prevented them from ever returning. Like many refugees, the rest of my family scattered across the world. I have relatives in Chile, Peru, Canada, Switzerland, Jordan, Lebanon, and the United States. We speak different languages, we celebrate different holidays, we eat different foods, but one thing we all share are stories of our homeland. Thanks, Hannah, so much. That was lovely. Um, and Nora, what can you tell us quickly about your book? Well, I won't read from the book. I'll just tell you. Um, this is my book, Ida in the Middle. I'm tremendously honored that it has won the Arab American Book Award for young adult category. And uh, it's about a Palestinian American eighth grader who is being bullied and ridiculed at school and is trying to be invisible and just make it through, which is an experience a lot of kids from different backgrounds can relate to. And then Ida eats an olive that was from a jar sent from her family, uh, her mother's family in Jerusalem, and it transports her to the life she would have had if her parents had never left Palestine in the first place. And from the experience of seeing Palestine and the United States, um, and both as a Palestinian, uh, she kind of realizes that there's things that are scary here and things that are beautiful here and things that are scary here and things that are beautiful here. And then she needs to decide where she wants to be, who she wants to be, and how she can raise her voice against the injustices in both of her homelands. Um, there is uh, a lot of excitement in the book when Ida gets trapped in a siege on a village during a home demolition, and she is stuck outside of the house responsible for a young boy, and uh, takes them a day and a half and like 50 pages to get back to safety. But um, overall, I think it's a book that shows um, a diversity of Palestinians, a diversity of Jews, it shows a young girl who's not sure how to make a difference, who over time challenges herself and is courageous enough to, to find her focus and find her passion and her mission to, um, to try to do her part to uh, find justice for her people. Thanks. I read the book and I can recommend it. It was um, really fun to, to read and to see how the magic happens. So um, I'd encourage you all to get a copy of it. Um, so we are um, approaching the time for a Q&A and I wondered if, um, if anyone has um, turned in any questions, um, you were to write them to the Methodist Federation for Social Action because the chat is pretty much locked right now. Um, but if you do, please um, put them in there anytime now. And in the meantime, I wanted to talk a little bit about generalized and specific censorship of Palestinians. What can, what we, we know that this happens. Um, books are censored, um, things are erased. 
what what should we do? We always like to leave people with some ideas of, of what we can do to help. So whoever wants to jump in a little bit, um, but what can UMKR and MFSA folks do about this censorship? Um, Nora, maybe you want to start. Well, I think that the words Palestine and Palestinian, especially the word Palestine, but both words in the United States have kind of a charge. Um, people tend not to say them because they're not sure if, how the other person will react or if people are going to feel uncomfortable or if it's going to create a conflict. I think the more that we can say those words, the more we can make it normal, whether it is simply um, as a teacher, when you say, who likes Mexican food? Who likes Chinese food? Who likes Palestinian food? It can be something like that. And, you know, just on up that from wherever we are positioned in our in our social lives or in our families, um, just making it normal to talk about Palestinian experience. Like uh, there are how many people? There's 67 people here. That's 67 dinnertime conversations about Palestine that could happen tonight where you just over dinner, you say, hi, it was a webinar today. It was about Palestine. What do you think? And that's already something. Um, and then we just go further and further in that direction of um, creating the space. And what's the purpose of that is to let Palestinians speak for themselves. Anyone else want to jump in? <clears throat> um, I think what I, I love what Nura says, and um, I know she's got this slew of uh, other ideas. One piece that's very important in, in this work and any work that we do, especially in social justice movements, is the work shouldn't always all be done and explained by the people who are going through, whether it's the suffering or the discrimination or the othering. There has to be a very, very deep entrenched work, not as allies, but as co-conspirators, as Dr. Bettina Love says, because change cannot come just from um, you know, the Palestinian people who are here, of course, they've been working on it. That's their lived experience. But we are in all the spaces all the time, but it shouldn't just be our responsibility to make sure that our voices are being heard or that books are being read or that saying the word Palestine, like Nora says, is triggering. We need people to be more co-conspirators and not just allies, because then the work gets done in spaces that were not there at all. But at the same token, how are you bringing us in? to amplify and uplift those voices, but also not always leaving the onus on us to have to explain everything. Because at the end of the day, it gets very tiring and it's also very, um, you know, you become very marginalized as it is, but we really need to have communities to really be intentional with how they want to present this and, and take it further. Yeah, and I would add, you know, just because I'm on the marketing side and I, I'm dealing with sort of digital data and algorithms, you know, every time you interact with a book online, um, it is sending a message, not just to the publisher, but to the retailer that it is a value. So whether that's going to the library and requesting the book, or even searching on your library's website for a book can can really help and, and leave a trail. I have to say with with book banning, you know, they have a really wonderful way of tracking book bans, except when it comes to books for for Palestine. As as Nora has mentioned to me before, Pan America is not tracking the book, the banning of Palestinian books. And often it happens um, what we call shadow banning in the shadows. So it'll be taken off of a library shelf in anticipation of conflict within that library system or school system. So even if it's happening in a very public way, like it is with some other books, it is absolutely happening. Um, so by asking where those books are and, and seeing if they're available in your children or grandchildren's library, um, that will take the banning out of the shadows um, and, and bring it to light. And then you, know, you can go from there. So thank you all for your great um, sharing and suggestions and just exposing things that give us something to think about and um, some new ways to act. Um, it is about the top of the hour. The conversation's been just so helpful. So I want to remind you all that we put a lot of information in the chat. And if you 
are if you have the chat open and at the very bottom of the page you can see at least on my screen it's at the bottom but somewhere there should be three dots and at, at when you open those there are a couple of things one says save the chat so if you click save the chat it will automatically save it into the zoom folder on your own computer and you can open it later and take a look at some of these resources um, we also encourage you to look at United Methodist Kairos Response website and MFSA's website, where we will post the video of this recording and all of the resources that have been put in the chat. So they will also be available in that way. So at this point, let me turn it back to Bridget. Thanks. Thanks you all so much. Hey everyone, uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, as Lisa mentioned, um, all this information will be up online. Um, and uh, if you receive our newsletters, which you can look in the chat um, and find information about that, uh, you will probably be emailed it as well. Um, I hope that all of you will uh, join us for our next webinar. Um, it will be in November and we'll focus on the continuing NACMA. We did a webinar earlier this year on the NACMA. So it'll be kind of like a part two or continuation of that conversation. Um, so I hope you will join us and you'll get more information about that webinar, um, all of that to come out on our, on our websites and social media. Um, so I hope that you will join us. Um, until then, um, thank you very much and take care.